Well, good afternoon, all of you. It's uh, great to see this large of a crowd here, so thanks for coming to this. Uh, I'm Dr. Jack Kim, the uh, Associate Dean of Academics for the uh, college, and uh, would like to welcome you for, for today. Today we have uh, our panel discussion, which is sponsored by the Culture, Regional Expertise, and Language Management Center, or Office, or CRELMO, with the National Defense University and the Command and General Staff College. The topic for today is cultural regional implications of Russian power projection in the gray zone. We have three speakers today. One of the speakers will be a uh, video teleconference in. That's Brigadier General retired Peter Zwack. He's a professor at the National Defense University, and he formerly served as a United States senior defense official and the attache to the Russian Federation. Our second panel member is uh, Dr. Bob Bauman. Dr. Bauman is the director of the graduate degree program for uh, Command and General Staff College and he just returned from a one-year assignment to Uzbekistan. He possesses an extensive Soviet Russia and Eurasia expertise and is uh, quite a talented author. Our third uh, panelist is Dr. Mahir Ibrahimov, who is the director of Kromo. He's a former Soviet soldier, born in uh, what is now Azerbaijan, a senior diplomat and the author of several books on Eurasia and the Middle East. Today's session will be moderated by Dr. Prisco Hernandez, who represents the Masters in Military Arts and Sciences program and the Cromo team at Command and General Staff College. The target live audience or the target live audience for today are military personnel, faculty, United States international students. This event is unclassified and expected to be connected through VTC to outliers. This is for attribution. As before, the event will be video telecom recorded and posted on Cromo's website and linked to YouTube along with some of the related materials. After the initial remarks by each of the panelists, the panelists will jointly answer your questions and reply to your comments. The outstations across the Army, including TRADOX uh, Centers of Excellence and schools will have a chance to participate in today's discussion through a video teleconference. If you have a question or a comment, we ask you to please use the microphones that are up here in the front and then uh, around the room. Without further ado, then I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Prisco Hernandez, who will continue to moderate through the session. Again, welcome this morning, this afternoon. Thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction, uh, Dr. Kim. Uh, thank all of you for being here with us uh, in this important session. Uh, the intent uh, is to offer you some of the uh, latest perspectives on the important topic of uh, Russia's expansionism and also Russia's activities in what is known as the gray zone by uh, three distinguished uh, observers of, of Russia uh, and scholarly observers of, of uh, the Russian scene. Um, again, uh, this is intended to be a uh, uh, session that's open to your questions and answers. Uh, as a way of engaging with, with the topic. And that applies as well to the outline stations that are connected to us uh, via VTC. Um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our first speaker at this time, uh, uh, Brigadier General Retired Peter Swack. Uh, he is a former U.S. Uh, senior defense official and attaché to the uh, Russian Federation. Uh, acted in that capacity from 2012 to 2014. Uh, by interacting with Russians at multiple levels since 1989, including defense, security, academics, policy veterans, and private citizens, Brigadier, Zouak, Brigadier General Zouak uh, developed a unique hands-on perspective on Russia and Eurasian security affairs during a turbulent period that included the recent strife in Crimea and the Eastern Ukraine. He served 34 years as military intelligence uh, officer and Eurasian foreign area officer, uh, including in locations such as Afghanistan, Kosovo, Russia, South Korea, and West Germany. He was inducted into the OCS Hall of Fame in 2015 and is the recipient of the Distinguished Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, the Defense Superior Service Medal, and many other awards and citations, including the Afghan Service Medal and the NATO Kosovo Medal. 
He was also honored as a Joint Chiefs of Staff Action Officer for 1991, and he qualified, he's an Airborne Ranger qualified. Brigadier General Schwack speaks Russian, German, Italian, and some French. Without further ado, I yield the floor to Brigadier General Schwack. Go ahead, sir. Um, team, uh, honored to uh, be able to speak on a really, really uh, complicated uh, topic, if you will, um, you know, aspects, if you will, and mil I'll just say aspects, military, societal, civil, aspects of the gray zone. Um, it's really, really important. Um, first thing, as you all know, we are on the eve of Zapad uh, 17. Um, everybody's watching it Next intently. Slide, Next slide. Um, my assessment on that, hello? You you too good you good you good Peter please continue. Okay, um, my assessment uh, right off the bat. Well, while there's a lot to be wor a lot to worry about, there'll be a lot of units moving and activities going. Then in the end, it will be first and foremost an exercise. Um, they will use, if you will, gray zone techniques because a huge part of this exercise is I/O, both internationally regionally and domestically for Russia's own population. I think in today's world, anytime you see Russian military conventional operations, all from low end to high end, there is a gray zone uh, aspect to that. And so um, I think it's important to make that point right, right, right on. What's going on with uh, Zapod 17 is it's much more than just a military exercise internally. Uh, I would submit that it's also um, um, a, a vehicle to get the Russian uh, population uh, increasingly materially and maybe more importantly for Russia psychologically ready than in case, uh, for conflict uh, in the West. First of all, I will say the Russians, I believe, do not want to go to war. They don't want conflict. But they're preparing for it. The narrative is such in Russia that is, is very, very negative, very, very concerning, and at times inevitability of such. When the Russians enter a exercise like this, but also their SNAP exercises that have been going on, uh, ongoing since 2013, it's all of society. It isn't just like we do an exercise. They mobilize, um, they mobilize their railway troops, as they're doing here, and they're going to put in gas pipeline troops. And they're going to be getting, ramping up their media and their messaging. They'll exercise aspects of their economy, medical services that, uh, that in the open source said that are exercising psychologically for mass casualties. Um, again, the mess, all of this is in this conventional gray zone world that is very, very difficult for us to deal with in the West. We are. We are, you know, are, are, with all our flaws and warts, we see our, you know, we are, uh, uh, we are little liberal democratic. We have an open and free media. We can't tell what the media to say. Um, and in Russia, the media and all the uh, organs of, if you will, press and news, it's a strategic front. And within that, they can really, really shape messages and then in the, in the non-kinetic gray zone world, where they are already in conflict with us, they are with an organic ruthlessness able to do things that we in the West in peace law, peacetime just rocks us on our heels. Um, again, you've seen it, the messaging, the disinformation, the fake news, cyber, and, cyber attacks, getting inside our governance system, sowing confusion, um, distrust, is, which was, I think, their primary fallout in December um, uh, in our own system. And then a political assassinations and all of that, again, in this very, very difficult and ugly um, uh, peacetime continuum that when you link it to military operations, especially on the conventional side, makes it a, 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 a difficult combination, a difficult aspect, if you will, to confront. I'm reluctant to use the word combat, but you know, in this zone, we have to figure out ways. Um, I, I will um, 
So, so while in, in this entree, just to try to juice the conversation, um, uh, I, I just think these are things to think about. Um, I, I, again, I think Zapod's going to be uh, very robust and noisy, but in the end, um, it, will, it will not uh, cross any major, if you will, regional red lines as far as crossing traditional borders. But the gray zone fight is already on and on, uh, on multiple fronts. Again, uh, the Russian population um, will be told that this is in response to, if you will, uh, threats. Uh, the notional um, activities is, if you will, uh, gray zone threats, uh, regime change possibly in Belarus or versus uh, Russia. And this is all part of this narrative that really, really makes, if you will, um, that feeds on, if you will, the perceived and contrived aspects of Russian existential threats. Um, again, all of this is in preparing their society for what they believe it w is potentially worst case. There is a sense of ine inevitability for it. Uh, that doesn't mean they want it, but uh, they're certainly preparing for that. Okay, over to you. This is my opening. Thank you very much, uh, General Swack, uh, for your uh, comments on the current uh, situation. Uh, now I will introduce to you the uh, second of our speakers for today, and this is Dr. Bob Bauman. Uh, Dr. Bauman is the director of the graduate degree programs at CGSC. Uh, he has recently returned to the college from a one-year assignment as the educational advisor to the Ministry of Defense in Uzbekistan. While in Tashkent, he served as a full-time faculty member at the Armed Forces Academy of Uzbekistan, and he contributed to a book on military education published by the Academy. Dr. Bauman is an expert in Russian and Eurasian affairs, and for 19 years has taught as a member of the Department of Military History here at CGSC. Dr. Bauman is the author of Russian and, uh, and Soviet Unconventional Wars in the Caucasus, Central Asia, and Afghanistan, and has published num numerous articles and chapters concerning Russian military history. He has also co-authored several books on stability and peacekeeping operations in places such as Haiti, Bosnia, and Somalia. Dr. Bauman worked and traveled extensively inside the former Soviet Union, having spent extended periods of time conducting graduate and postdoctoral research at Moscow and Leningrad State Universities. Since the dissolution of the USSR, he has made many research trips to Russia and other parts of what is now known as the post-Soviet space. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Bauman, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hernandez. Uh, I won't uh, say anything further about the current exercise uh, Zapad that uh, Brigadier General retired uh, Peter Zwack uh, referred to. Uh, that is interesting and ongoing, and doubtless there will be more comment in the near future. My intent instead is to talk a little bit about the big picture, uh, what's going on broadly with respect to Russian activity in the gray zone, uh, what we might often refer to as, as infra information operations. Uh, I, I think to start with, uh, with their perspective, uh, I think to some degree they feel that they're really being reactive rather than uh, proactive or, or provocative. It's easy for us to forget that uh, the United States is a global economic and cultural colossus. And we invade everybody else's space with our messages, our films, our television, and so forth all the time routinely without giving it a second thought. There's no malice involved, we just do that because of our, uh, of our size. Uh, Russia, among other places, uh, has been concerned about all the messages that reach into their society uh, from, uh, from outside. Now, these often don't dovetail uh, with wishes inside the Kremlin, uh, and uh, therefore they've uh, decided to amplify uh, their own operations up and down the spectrum. Uh, General Zwack uh, referred to both the domestic and regional and international components of the, uh, of the Russian approach. Uh, this, in a way, uh, harkens back to the days of the, uh, of the good old Soviet Union, 
uh, when there was really quite uh, well orchestrated uh, effort to uh, harmonize and disseminate information on a, on a variety of topics. It's actually a little less centralized and perfectly orchestrated now uh, than it was then, you know, having uh, observed that for, uh, uh, for many years. Uh, in terms of their domestic audience, uh, the Soviets are doing a couple of things. Uh, if we might uh, move this uh, next slide, please. Uh, Military History Society, and a word about that. Uh, to come. Military history has, uh, has become really, really big uh, in Russia. Uh, they see it as a terrific vehicle uh, for stimulating uh, patriotism and patriotic responses to uh, international affairs. Uh, people are frequently reminded of the defenses of Russia, especially in 1812 and in, uh, in World War II. Uh, there is great enthusiasm for reenactments uh, in Russia. There's also extensive participation uh, by professional and amateur historians. So this is a, a big activity. It's got state-level encouragement. Um, and it's a, a thriving enterprise. Uh, next slide. Uh, <coughs> celebrating Victory Day, the end of uh, the Great Patriotic War, as it's known there, has long been a, uh, a staple. And the respect, homage given to veterans of the Great Patriotic War uh, continues to really impress uh, outsiders. I mean, we're familiar with things that happen here on Memorial Day or Veterans Day. They take it up a notch. Uh, in, uh, in Moscow on, uh, on Victory Day, People will buy you know, kids, various folks will, will purchase flowers from any of innumerable stands and walk up to the nearest veteran with a decorated uh, jacket and present them uh, with flowers and personal thanks uh, for their service. Uh, it's, uh, it's all very impressive and it clearly resonates uh, in, the, in the Russian heart. This is uh, something that's important, uh, not just as a piece of historical memory, but as a piece of ongoing and current culture. Uh, next slide. Uh, with respect to the current media environment. This is a, uh, a snapshot from a uh, St. Petersburg newspaper shortly after the Malaysian Airways uh, episode several years ago when it was shot down over Ukraine. And of course, there was immediately a great international news uproar about what happened and, and how it happened. Uh, Russia was quick to respond uh, with getting various interpretations out that did not indict either uh, Russian-backed separatists uh, in Ukraine or any uh, official participants on, uh, on Russia's behalf. Uh, they got out a variety of stories. What's interesting is that the, they didn't come out with necessarily one story. There was a variety of stories. And this reflects something that's a bit different than the old uh, Soviet approach. A, uh, a writer, uh, uh, Peter Pomerantsev, uh, has written about this uh, in a book, and it's uh, a rough paraphrase. Um, uh, Nothing is true, anything is possible. Uh, the, idea now seems uh, to be more to create a lot of white noise around the news to make it impossible domestically and to a degree internationally to determine, well, what exactly did happen? People will shrug. They don't know. They'll move on to the next subject. It's, uh, it's, it's not so clear. Uh, but this, uh, this kind of white noise is, uh, is rather effective. Um, it's, it's quite effective domestically, and it has some impact beyond Russia's borders as well. Within the region, uh, or within what we might describe as the post-Soviet area, uh, that is, that zone consisting of now independent states that were once part of the, uh, of the Soviet Union, uh, the message gets out well, too. It's, it's important to keep in mind uh, that there is a Russian-speaking zone all along Russia's periphery. Uh, partly that consists of ethnic Russians who are, of course, Russian speakers. A lot of it consists of non-Russians who still know Russian or speak Russian or have been taught Russian by virtue of the fact that during the Soviet period, Russian was the automatic default second language for everybody uh, if Russian wasn't their first language. Uh, so there's still an audience out there uh, that they can reach. And it's not just with, uh, with news or what we might describe as propaganda. Uh, there's a whole cultural spectrum, spectrum of activity, television programs, movies, uh, and the like, uh, many of which artfully get across uh, themes uh, that are uh, uh, patriotic, uh, broadly supportive of a, uh, of a Russian point of view. Uh, you can find this in, uh, in historical movies. Uh, the, uh, during the last year, I spent lots and lots and lots of time watching uh, Russian uh, television and going to Russian movies and whatnot. And, and you, could, you could find uh, emphasis of some important themes in, uh, in an awful lot of this stuff. Um, and, and this isn't necessarily you know, centrally directed from some office in the Kremlin. Uh, this is often you know, folks 
creating artistic works on their own, uh, but fully aware uh, that there's some official encouragement uh, and approval given uh, to stuff that kind of resonates with, uh, with the big idea. Uh, finally, in terms of the, the international reach, whether we're talking about uh, you know, the United States uh, during the, uh, the fall of 2016 and, and stuff in elections or, or the uh, frequent uh, outbursts of activity uh, in, uh, in social media and, uh, and, and whatnot, uh, the Russians have been really resourceful in taking advantage of this opportunity. Um, they've got uh, a lot of really media, uh, internet savvy individuals and hordes of, of volunteers who, who kind of find this is a good time see it as sort of a, a great global prank uh, that, uh, that they can participate in. And it, uh, it certainly does have uh, some effect. You know, I can, in the last year I managed to you know, speak with some people about this, uh, folks who had formerly lived in the Soviet Union, and, and, uh, and I d described the situation. And the, and the first reaction among many was, you know, with respect to the United States, well, you know, it's your own fault. Not that we provoked it, but that we've left ourselves so wide open to it. You know, we've got this uh, domestic environment in which uh, all political discussion is hypercharged. Yeah, we're contentious, we're argumentative. We've made, uh, you know, uh, stirring up indignation sort of the, the, the currency of uh, the internet and, and media space. And so uh, their attitude was, you know, you guys have kind of brought this upon yourselves to some degree. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, that'll do for my intro. Thank you, Dr. Bauman, for your uh, enlightening presentation of what's happening in the, uh, in the Russian near abroad. And uh, finally, uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce you to Dr. Mahir Ibrahimov. And Dr. Ibrahimov, as you know, is the uh, director of Kremlin. Uh, he's the one that puts together these forums for you and for the Army. Uh, Dr. Ibrahimov um, served in the Soviet Army, and he uh, personally witnessed the breakup of the Soviet Union. He was the chief expert uh, in the Soviet Union on, on the League of Scientific and Industrial Associations. He was also a senior Middle East expert for the, uh, for the uh, Soviet uh, Red Cross. And as a former senior diplomat, he helped to open the first uh, embassy uh, from Azerbaijan in Washington, D.C. Dr. Ibrahimov, uh, is, uh, writes on socioeconomic, uh, political, uh, geopolitical, and cultural issues, particularly re as they relate to Russia and Eurasia, uh, Southwest and Central Asia, and the Middle East. He is fluent in five languages and versed in many cultures. Dr. Ibrahimov has instructed U.S. diplomats in languages and cultures at the Department of State and has provided vital assistance as a multilingual cultural advisor for U.S. forces during OIF II. Uh, Dr. Ibrahimov is the author of the book, Invitation to Rain, a story of the road taken towards freedom. Uh, he's also the author of Life Looking Death in the Eye, and also of uh, the anthology, Cultural Perspectives, Geopolitics, and Energy Security in Eurasia among numerous other publications, including those in foreign languages. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Ibrahimov, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Hernandez, and thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm sorry I cannot sit, I kind of <laughs> never can sit quietly when I speak to the public. Um, I assume that everybody came here not to see my special haircut, right? <laughs> you came here because of this important topic and because of these distinguished speakers. So without any question, the topic is very vital, very important right now. Why? But before I start talking about the content, let me define. We're talking about the Russian engagement in the gray zone, right? What is the gray zone? If you review the literature, you sometimes you can meet the definition uncertain areas for US national security objectives. That's one definition. But more often, you can see the definition unconditional, non-conditional, untraditional uh, warfare or military capabilities. So that's what it is. And that kind of characterized with amb ambiguity. There is no clear geographical borders, like it was in the NATO, uh, USSR-led uh, Warsaw Pact and NATO-led 
uh, uh, US-led NATO, when you had clear geographical borders, contacts of engagement, etc., supposedly, uh, but not in this case. So why we think sometimes that Russia uh, may, might be good in its engagement with the gray zone? So first of all, soft power, human domain. Human domain is integral part of the Russian engagement in the gray zone. By the way, China and other major players also uh, join in the club, which is exacerbating the operational environment. You, we need to understand the adversary for any uh, situations, particularly, especially in the gray zone uh, activities, because understanding the sociocultural considerations, history um, of the region, of the adversary, very important. Let me give you some examples. Russia's popular culture industry. Television new channels, such as RT and TV, first channel. The Ruski Mir, which is the Russian rule, created by President Putin in 2007 for cooperations with Russian speakers globally, overseas. Pro-Russian political cultural NGOs. RUNET, the Russian language segment of the internet, the Russian Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Russian cultural groups, branches of the prominent Russian universities across the post-Soviet space, pipeline politics, sometimes we call them pipeline diplomacy. This is all part of the soft power, non-conditional, untraditional uh, kind of military, uh, utilization of the military capabilities. Okay, so, as an example, concept of Eurasianism, we talked about that before. What is it? In the end of the uh, presentations, we gave some reading uh, suggestions, and we included the two books by Alexander Dugin, The Fourth Political Theory and Eurasian Mission, an Introduction to Neo-Eurasianism. Suffering Across the History, just examples, Great Patriotic War, prior to that, Napoleon's invasion to 1812, and of course, uh, uh, Mongol Tatar domination prior to, to the Great Patriotic War for, for centuries. That kind of shaped the Russian mindset. Guess what? It, to a certain extent, it explains why Russia is sensitive towards the NATO's expansion towards its borders because of the past tragic experiences, okay? The certain Russian mindset. All this was reflected clearly in the current Russian uh, guiding documents, such as Russian national security strategy and uh, updated military doctrine, among other guiding documents. If you read, uh, of course they're in Russian, if you read them, you can directly see the reflection between the lines, indirectly or directly. Now, next slide please. When you have time at your spare, we're not going to elaborate on this. This is the example of gas pipelines to Europe originating from Russia. It's part of the soft power, okay? Non-traditional warfare, because depending where the pipeline, oil pipeline or gas pipeline originating from, or which territories is passing through, those countries have a leverage in their internal and external politics. Next slide, please. Many of you heard about uh, this uh, Russian senior leader, Russian Army Chief of Staff, General Staff Ger uh, Valery uh, Gerasimov. I, I want to emphasize, this is a concept, nothing to do with the doctrine. It never became a doctrine. Some people wrongly referring to it as a doctrine. What happened was, one click, please. One more click. One more. One more. So this is the reference. Simply, this военно промышленный courier or military industrial courier, along with военная uh, мысль, which is the military thought, this is the venue for senior Russian leaders to exchange their opinions, ideas. That's what he did back in 2013. Okay? But guess what? Since then, whatever he said, 
Here is the gist of his thoughts. It's happening regionally and globally. And it's reflected in what Russia is doing in the gray zone. Okay? It's amazing, but in 2013, he expressed that. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we want to play quick video clips, one minute each. I want to just a little bit give a back, quick background. The first click, uh, video clip is called Dance Russia Cry Europe. It's accompanied with a popular pro-Russia song and video clip on Eastern Ukraine. Okay, so there are several messages uh, that they're trying to send to the external and internal audiences that, number one, situation is Ukraine, in Ukraine is a complete failure, okay? Number two message, that Russia is not involved, it's completely local movement, pro-Russia rebels, including Cossacks and others, fighting for their independence, identity, etc. And the third message, probably not least important, is whatever is going in Ukraine, in the east of Ukraine, this, uh, the, the, the West and the United States are behind. Okay? Mostly three messages. Let's please play the video. So the, the first screen said that this is the message from the locally established. As you know, there were two republics, self-established republics in Donbas, in the Donbas of the eastern Ukraine, right? Who knows what the names of those? Anybody knows? Okay. Dr. Bauman. Donbas is the whole area, okay? You have uh, Donetsk Republic, one. And that's what this says, DNR, the message from the Donetsk Republic of Donbass. Okay, nothing to do with Russia proper. This is their message to, and somewhere it says, either in the second clip or first, it says the message to the Ukrainian junta, like equi equi equating them to the kind of fascists or whatever. So according to the clip. Okay, before we go to the second, just one minute or less, you see what it says? Nova Russia, actually in English, New Russia, quick historical tool. It goes back to the Tsarist era, this concept, uniting the Russian Empire among the old Russian speakers. Okay? This is a concept which emerged at, at the time of Putin. So let's let's uh, play the clip, please. Mm. Republic of Nova Russia, that's what it says. Don Kazakhs going to the to the rescue of their brothers in the Donbas.
This is the traditional Cossack song, just for those who don't know. The, they are the Cossacks as a concept. This is the cultural community within the Russian community, with Russia. Traditional have been established under the Tsars, Russian Tsars, to defend the Russian Empire's borders. They are traditionally, I, sometimes I compare them to the, the uh, uh, to the cowboys in the mid Midwest, like because they have this culture of good fighters, right? Riding the horses, they have their own uniform, striped pants, furred hats, bull uh, like uh, bullets in their uh, right here, and the knives. So special people. Why don't Cossacks? They're Cossacks in different parts of Russia and Ukraine as well, by the way. So don Cossacks. I've been in that area. It's a very interesting area. So Don is the river. Kozak, uh, Rostov on Don, Rostov city on the river Don. That why, why, that's why they're called Don Kozaks. Does that make sense? Okay, now, so, any questions so far? But we'll have an opportunity to ask questions and answers. And this is the ch picture which depicts the victory of pro russia rebels, and this is the Kozak hugging another rebel, pro russia rebel, after they took over the Baltsovo, important, strategically important, the Baltsovo town with important rail hub. So it was in February 2015. Next slide, please. Finally, wow, this is a reading list, right? Okay, everybody needs to read all these until tomorrow. So, just kidding. But <coughs> this is for your convenience. We always recommend to diversify your resources. Uh, of course, it's ideal if you can read in foreign languages. You can read regional resources as well. But uh, if you don't, we have a lot of English-speaking sources as well, good, great sources as well. Uh, we just, this morning, we in included General Zwack's uh, article we just published right here. So Dr. Bauman's uh, uh, work here. So this is, we just published through Krelmo, uh, the book, which is ontology, was, was referenced right here. And we have a video related to it. Dr. Hernandez was part of it. So this ontology we strongly recommend because it includes everything we're discussing today and more. Very deep analysis, very diversified resources. Next slide, please. So uh, with that, I will yield the floor to Dr. Hernandez. Uh, Dr. Ibrahimov, uh, excellent presentation once more. Uh, at this time, what we would like to do is open the floor for your questions or concerns. Uh, and uh, also, that includes the outline stations. Please uh, feel free to, uh, to include your, uh, your questions as well in the discussion. Um, so with, with that, uh, uh, please note that there are two microphones here and since the session is being recorded, uh, you would do well to go to the microphone so that you're very clear uh, in, the, in the recording and everybody can benefit. So please go ahead and uh, you may pose questions at this time to any of our panelists uh, and uh, we'll go from there. The floor is open for questions. I'd like to uh, ask the panel. Okay. It should be on. Is it on? Great. Sorry, I think we got it now. So you can use just in case. Can you hear me? This thing says it's on. Oh, it's on. <laughs> it's on. So? All right, I'll just walk my poster here. Um, the question for the panelists, the two of you have mentioned this so far. There's been uh, some significant civil disobedience in Belarus. And uh, my related question to that is I've spent some time in uh, Ukraine recently. And the idea of the Slavic brothers between Ukraine and Russia no longer exists. There's very strong Ukrainian nationalism. And of course, the Ukrainian forces have significantly increased in their capabilities. So I wonder about um, 
what will happen in Belarus, and also do you think that from Ukraine that they might go ahead and start uh, active combat actions against uh, Donetsk and Luhansk? Me, we'll see. Okay. I'll get the ball rolling. Uh, I personally don't see that any uh, additional military actions are, are imminent. Uh, I think uh, Russia may have had its fill as far as uh, Donetsk and Lukansk are uh, concerned for the, uh, for the moment. Uh, keeping an eye on the situation in uh, uh, Belarus uh, is uh, prudent. Uh, there, there has been some... Uh, uh, some friction and concern there, and you have a scenario that's set up uh, a little bit similarly. I, the uh, scenario I have in mind is in, in certain places in the former Soviet Union where you have significant Russian, ethnic Russian populations, um, there is a, a group of people who are potentially mobilizable uh, if you can fire them up, um, as happened in U Ukraine with uh, uh, raising concerns that you know, they were, they were at risk, uh, and therefore something, uh, something had to be done. Um, I think, uh, for the most part, uh, Russia wants to uh, be as little involved in forceful actions as, uh, as it can get by with. Um, that's not the, uh, not the preferred MO. I think some of the point of exercises and, you know, violations of foreign airspace and all these other things that go on are uh, uh, demonstrations that are really intended to prevent the actual use of uh, military force by impressing upon people what their, what their capabilities are. Uh, the um, current economic climate uh, certainly has some constraining effect on, uh, on what Russia does since the uh, price of oil and gas internationally went down. Uh, Russia's economic position has weakened uh, considerably. Um, and that's not likely to change a lot for the better in the near or medium or even long term, since we seem to be turning up additional sources uh, and develop, de developing them all, uh, all the time. And in fact, the United States <laughs> is actively taking a role in changing the global uh, prospectus uh, for uh, for oil and gas uh, oil and gas uh, prices. Uh, so, um, if if Russia is going to play the long game, and I think they they usually do, uh, they have to be somewhat mindful of just how much they can spend, uh, which dictates uh, just how far they can go in uh, in various kinds of activities. Yeah, I, I would be happy to add. I think everything Dr. Bauman said makes sense, a lot of sense. So, I do not believe, and I agree with the fact that. There is a um, sense that all sides trying to avoid the conflict, including the Russians. Okay, that's why this engagement in the gray zone is accelerating. So, uh, because honestly, frankly, I mean, Russia is doing quite well in terms of the using the soft power and uh, the you know engagement in the gray zone than to get like to put the, some foot on the ground, like, which happened uh, in, in the five days war with Georgia uh, into, back in 2008, right? But again, the circumstances then were different, okay? And we can talk about that if you have questions, I, I, we can give you, we can share with you with more details what happened in Georgia and why that happened. But other than that, uh, I, we always say that Russia is not excluding. It's kind of pro, uh, pro acting, right? It never exclu excluding any possibilities. That's why they, are, uh, they keep improving uh, their military capabilities. By the way, just today, there's a time difference, right, between us and Europe and Russia, particularly and Turkey. On Tuesday, there was a deal signed between, and, and that was reported by Associated France, France Press. The deal between the NATO member and Russia on S-400, it was signed today. Anybody is aware of that? So that's a big deal. We, I believe we should be concerned about that, I believe, because S-400, quite sophisticated weaponry, which is capable to, and by the way, Russians deployed that, as far as I know, in Syria, S-400s. So this is the major, and th that can carry uh, nuclear warheads as well. So this is air, uh, the, the, 
the ground air kind of capability missiles. So, uh, and uh, according to Erdogan, the president of Turkey, uh, the down payment already been ship, uh, sent to Russia. It's a done deal. Now, so what it tells us, Russia is prepared, depending on the circumstances, first of all, to continue using the soft power because Russia is very good at it for one, one simple reason. Russia has been the, in the region for centuries. You know, they have this sociocultural, historical, linguistic aptitude common with the region, okay? We, we have some issues with that across the ocean, correct? Sometimes understanding the cultures, right? Might, be, might have some issues. But they don't, they understand essentially the Ukrainian mentality, Belarusian mentality, centuries common aptitude. Believe this is the reality, right? Is up. Was that? Oh yeah, I uh, understand, General Swat. You have some comments oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. to uh, to the effect uh, to the question, please. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, first of all, um, uh, the question um, uh, um, and comment uh, referring to uh, Ukraine, I think, was is very very uh, important. Um, as far as the whole Slavic brother narrative. And, and um, uh, yes, um, there, there are Russians that have Ukrainian in them and Ukrainian that have Russians, but if there's anything that 2014 uh, uh, showed us and the really, really difficult, ugly battles in the uh, spring and summer of 14, that's where I believe modern Ukraine was born. And while Ukrainians today, the, the bulk of them, um, are not necessarily anti-Russian. They're now very pro-Ukrainian. They'll fight for it. I think that's, that really shocked the Russians. And whatever that 10 to 12 million so-called Russian-speaking minority, um, that, you know, a number of them are proud to be ethnically Russian, but don't necessarily uh, want to be part of Russia. So uh, this was a, a, a major, major, major... Uh, challenge for Russia, I think, it, it, and, 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 and now they're kind of stuck there in some sort of ugly, sort of almost Northern Ireland on steroids situation um, because they have to prop up the, uh, the separatists. Um, and then on top of that, in 14, they got hit with just cascading tough things because with that, uh, the EU toughened and they got sanctioned and NATO, NATO refocused its mission. And then you had uh, Air Malaysia shoot, get shot down in 20, uh, uh, that summer, which was, was a terrible blow for them in the, uh, in the information space of the gray zone. So Ukraine was really, really uh, uh, difficult. And, 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 um, and this is just, I think, uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Bauman's assessment. It's going to limp along. I don't think anything major is going to uh, happen. Belarus, um, again, uh, the professors talked about already. Uh, geography, um, historical buffer. Uh, Belarus was the uh, gateway portal for both Napoleon's Grand Army and their Wehrmacht's Army Group Center. They came right down that way. So r the Russians historically are sensitive um, to a prospect of, uh, as they were so worried about 2014 Ukraine, um, if, uh, if Lukashenko goes wobbly, and uh, Belarus starts to, uh, um, you know, head west in some way. Uh, this could uh, create the, uh, this could create a what I would call reactive, reactively preemptive Russian action in Belarus. Uh, Belarus is complex again, as professors um, uh, indicate. And while they are uh, first and foremost, they are a Russian ally. Uh, Lukashenko, it's prickly. It's not easy. The, Belar the Belarus uh, formally basically demarched the Russians uh, during 2014, during the annexation of Crimea. They, while supportive of Russia, they didn't like that type of activity. Um, and I think that's important. And also, uh, anybody under 40 today in Belarus, it, while they are, again, proud of whatever you would call a strong Russian pull in many ways, um, don't remember the Soviet Union and a union, if you will, um, um, with, uh, with uh, a greater Russia. So, so they've got to manage that. I also agree with the professors that the Russians have got to manage that. I think um, 
for the Russians to make an intervention, um, an, an adventure in there, uh, without a, 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 a darn good reason that they can sell to their own population, um, let alone the West, which would be very, very difficult, uh, this will be, uh, will be hard. They will have military, they have military now in Belarus, the Russians do, primarily logistics troops and uh, facilitating troops. Um, and there will be more troops that come, into the, uh, come in for the exercise zone. But I'm absolutely, I'm very sure that if they wanted to station permanently more troops, they would have to get, um, even though they're the hegemon, that uh, they would, they would uh, have to get a tacit approval from Lukashenko or else it starts to go bad for Russia um, um, very, very quickly in that region. Thank you. Okay, uh, other questions, please? I'll take a whack at that to begin. It's a lot of the uh, programming is still fresh in my, uh, in my memory. Uh, I think uh, the, the current efforts are a lot more artful. They're probably also less centrally directed. I think uh, you know, an office in, uh, in, in, the, in the capital had much more to say about every film that was produced, every play that was produced, and so forth in the Soviet Union uh, than they do about the stuff that's commercially produced now. Having that said, a lot of the stuff that's commercially produced definitely is reinforcing some messages uh, that uh, are welcome uh, in the office of, say, uh, Vladimir Bedinsky, who is the uh, uh, Minister of Culture uh, in Russia, which is an, an office dedicated uh, to the proposition that they want to maintain a cultural space in which certain ideas uh, really resonate. Um, so. <coughs> Uh, I think the, the quality of programming is a lot more sophisticated than it was uh, 30 years ago. The audience is a lot more sophisticated. Keep in mind, in the, in the Soviet Union, people rarely saw, and if they did see them at all, it was very late, uh, Western movies. They certainly didn't see Western television programs. There wasn't that much competition uh, in terms of, uh, you might say, intellectual combat in, uh, in their space. Now, you know, having just come back, from a, for example, from Uzbekistan, but this is also largely true in Russia, you know, 80 percent of the movies that would show up at, uh, at the theaters were American. Uh, uh, you know, everything, you know, Wonder Woman or Dunkirk and, and on and on and on, all, all Western with Western messages and so on and so forth. Um, so they have to be you know, pretty good to, to keep up uh, and to get uh, some of their own messaging across. Uh, I think the, the quality of uh, television programming, especially some of the serials that are now appearing on, uh, serialized programs that are appearing on uh, some of the Russian television networks have really taken it up a notch in terms of subtlety. Uh, they're also uh, much more willing than, uh, than they were in the Soviet period to admit some, some past mistakes of Russia or the Soviet Union. There's a level of nuance that just wasn't there before. Um, but they still, in the main, you know, managed to push across some, uh, some important messaging about you know, Russian traditions and patriotism, the burdens of leadership in, in Russian space, and uh, the challenges of dealing with, uh, with the West that's not always their buddy, uh, the sense of frequent betrayal, in, indeed, from, uh, from Western allies. This all appears in, in much more nuanced ways uh, in their stuff. So I think they've definitely raised their game in terms of the quality of, uh, of things. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot more subtle. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's still there. John Zwack, do you want to add something? John Zwack, do you, would you like to uh, add uh, to what was said? They were discussing the difference between Soviet era and present day um, propaganda or information. Uh, okay, I'll take a whack at it. I missed the initial question. Uh, first of all, um, um, I think that the the, the style of messaging um, may be similar, but um, the current sophistication, leveraging all the new age information tools uh, that the Russians have today, 
um, has just uh, has have 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 made. Uh, they're just they're they're very polished, and you see that everything from RT here in the West. That if you are not paying close attention, the messaging that comes out that way or via Sputnik can be quite seductive um, and quite credible. Um, and then, of course, you 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 the the. Um, and in Russia, you have variations of that. They might turn up the ampage a little bit more on that. Um, but uh, no, the, 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 if this is what your question is, um, 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 you know, they're, they're embodying the same principles in many ways of the old agitprop, if you will, uh, early Soviet period, um, agitation, propaganda, and all of that. But they're much more polished and refined. Um, and um, uh, and it's, it's something that, frankly, that um, we don't do very well, uh, I think, as a, as a West, uh, in part because I don't think we, uh, we, 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 we tell our message very well, and we don't tell the truth very well. No, that, that doesn't, I don't want to say it that way. We, we are not good at relaying, if you will, the truths to uh, counterman their arguments. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Please make sure that uh, uh, you're close to the mic, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Major Ragidius Chutas from Lithuania. I, I have a. I want to make one clarification, and then, and then I have a question. So, uh, first thing is, uh, uh, we understand Russian uh, activities in green zone. Gray zone. We call it a hybrid warfare. And it includes uh, much more than only propaganda and, and conventional threat. Uh, we think that th they are really creative in that. They use all the sources to mix uh, asymmetric and symmetric uh, type of uh, threats as uh, organized crime, uh, uh, support to terrorist groups, buying politicians. And uh, so uh, really, really a big list of uh, activities, uh, or, or as they call it, uh, active measures uh, that they, they can do to uh, to get advantage in the so-called gray zone. And uh, we think that uh, they are so successful in that because of two things. First of all, they are, it, it is not a democratic country, so they can do what they want. Uh, they, do not, they are not accountable to opposing parties or to their population. That's one thing. Another thing is uh, the background of uh, those who rule now Russian, uh, Russian country. Uh, they, they have a, uh, experience in, in uh, uh, secret services, or, or as the Russians call it, siloviki. So uh, the guys who are uh, experienced in doing special operations and the mixture as well with uh, uh, business partners who are uh, mostly came from organized crime. So these guys have a pretty good background for creative things in, in gray zone. Um, and my question regarding to that would be, uh, what you think? Uh, uh, we believe that the, after Russians make, made so much uh, destabilization in, in Caucasus region, in, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, like in uh, Ukraine and Moldova, uh, we think that next step uh, for them would be probably to challenge NATO, and uh, not to challenge NATO just because to see which one is uh, more strong, but just uh, in order to show for their own population that NATO is not capable to react. So, uh, you know, NATO is based on Article 5 or uh, on uh, collective defense. Uh, and uh, gray, so it, it's easy to uh, activate Article 5 when it's open threat, uh, war is declared, so all countries sit together and they decide, yes, there is a threat, let's uh, proclaim war on uh, this country or, or on terrorists or whatever. But uh, there is activities in the gray zone, and uh, we believe that Baltic, uh, Baltic states like Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, uh, in this case, is pretty pretty suitable uh, area for activities in gray zone to test NATO, uh, because we have a Russian population, we have uh, Russian channels, uh, we have probably biased uh, politicians who are pro-Russian, so it's pretty good ground to test NATO Article 5. So what you think? Where could be the, the, the triggering point that NATO, uh, knowing its uh, fragmented decision-making process, 
could decide that, okay, it's Article 5, we, we activate that and we will defend Baltic states. Thanks. Uh, you, you make some great observations. That's a, it's a really intriguing point. That's, and, and, and in a way, that's one of the major strategic and political questions of the, uh, of the moment. Um, I think uh, probably the, the ideal scenario uh, from uh, the point of view of, of, of some in Moscow with respect to NATO and Article 5 uh, would be that uh, they could ratchet up tensions to a point where there's internal discussion, public discussion within Western Europe about whether countries really want to pony up and support Article 5 uh, in, uh, in the crunch. Uh, I think a lot of creating the, the, the landscape uh, for that question is, is, is psychological and based on uh, information war and, and certainly uh, demonstrations of various kinds of military activity across the frontier uh, bring that question to the fore again and again. Um, so I, I think they really don't actually want a conflict with, uh, with NATO, uh, but uh, I think they, they find some advantage in tension uh, along the frontier of a sort that keeps this conversation rolling within NATO, within NATO circles, within Western Europe, uh, in the hope that it, at some point this will become a little divisive and there will be internal public debate um, that might call into question Article 5. Uh, before I add, you want to ask General Zwerg? Maybe he has come. Uh, General Zwerg, again, do you have uh, uh, your own uh, viewpoints on this particular issue of whether um, Russia is trying to create some uh, dissension amongst uh, NATO members uh, to take advantage of that in the, in the geopolitics of the area? Uh, yes. Um, um, I believe that... Um, Western institutions in general, um, whether it is the European Union or NATO, um, they see as anathema, if you will, to their long, long-term existence, which is unfortunate because I'm of the view that the West is their ultimately is their life raft when you go out a generation and a half when everything else is going bad in their periphery. But staying with NATO, it's a dangerous game. I'm, I'm sure they're thinking about it. I'm sure they dabble in the capitals. Um, we've, we've read it. Um, I was, we were quite worried in 14 and 15 as a follow-on when the Russians had some momentum and we didn't know what was going on. Um, I would uh, submit that the Russians would have to be feeling ex threats existentially as they were feeling uh, in the post bolotnaya 2011-2012, when I think the regime really was feeling under assault, and then a whole string of things led all the way into 2014. Um, I think Russia right now, despite the sanctions, um, um, is, is, um, is had a string, if you will, of high-profile diplomatic um, um, if not successes, they're visible, and they've boxed out of the um, boxed out of the isolation that they were in before Syria. Um, so I think to take on NATO, yeah, I, I, I believe that. Yeah, I think in 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 the planners' view, yeah, it would be great to crack the alliance, but they also have to realize if they think they can break NATO 29 now. That doesn't mean you're not going to get a very, very aggressive and lethal coalition of the willing that go in and help our Eastern Europe European allies anyway. Um, and I think the Russians have to take that into consideration. To take a gray zone jump like that, and that's the key point, how far do they go, especially when those Russian populations, uh, if there's, there's heavily Russian ethnic populations, especially in, in Estonia and Latvia, again, I think they're proud of it. We're, I'm hearing from the youth, they're proud of their Russian ethnicity again, but they don't want um, Krematorsk and, uh, and uh, Debaltseva coming to Narva and Dogov Peels anytime soon and don't want to necessarily become part of the Russian project. So I think it's a major risk for the Russians to undertake something 
Uh, in the Baltics, I think that they would be feeling ex existentially threatened um, uh, because if it were to fail and the, and the world is on to them, and we got to understand when we look at Russia, we're talking about the West right now, Russia is huge. It's 11 time zones. And in its hugeness, it's rich, but it's also extremely vulnerable. And its dem demographics make it really, really tough to get into adventures um, that they can't sustain. And I think all of this goes on, if you will, in the Russian mindset. So yes, would they ideally, in a perfect critical straight line, like to crack NATO or EU and by extension NATO? Yes. Um, they may do some things as they've been doing through parliaments and other things. Um, but you know, even that, all of a sudden, it looks like the West is more on to some of this gray zone uh, stuff. And, and, and what happens some of the Eastern European capitals mm -hmm. and also in frankly, Washington DC in our own country over Christmas um, is almost been a, uh, a it's created antibodies in the West too if you will, some of the most malign gray zone type activities um, insofar as you saw what happened with France and you saw the Dutch, um, um, uh, they, they, they rebuffed, if you will, these type of, of, of right wing pushes that may have a Russian link, though we have obviously still concerns in Eastern Europe. So it's a big move. It's a consequential move. Um, and, and the bottom line is I think they would have to feel the stressors they are feeling before Ukraine um, before, uh, before they were to launch on a major adventure, because if it were to fail or it were to stalemate, that would bring the regime down. It might be the Russian people, ultimately, that do it. Thank you, General Swack. At this time, I would like to... Uh, Can I add to this? Yes. To, uh, to the question. Uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahimov has a, a further comments. Uh, so go ahead, please. Same question? Yes, um, same question. So actually, it's a very interesting question because uh, if you, and the, uh, interesting that the, the student from Estonia, you know, there is a Narva area. It's an interesting area. I've been there for quite an extended period of time. There is a Narva river. Across the river, there are Russia and Estonia. And the two castles, you know, the ancient castle. Very interesting area. So, and Russians are doing a lot of stuff in terms of the engagement in the gray zone around this Narva area, compactly leaving a Russian-speaking population. So, but, but most importantly, I want to uh, make two main uh, points. Reading the Russian um, guiding documents, national security strategy and updated uh, military doctrine, you, you can clearly read be, uh, uh, between the lines. They, they have a clearly strategy to split NATO, politically, right? and then to split European Union economically. So economic and political split or strategic split. So looking at the geopolitics, what's going on right now? Let me give you example. I, we mentioned earlier this, the deal between Turkey and Russia. It's a NATO member. The split already happening essentially, okay? So now, um, also as a part of it, Russia and China, your enemy is my friend concept, uh, teaming up like BRICS organization, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. It is equated to uh, NATO essentially, potentially. Or uh, Eurasian Customs Union. It's equated to International Monetary Fund or World Bank. So they're active on both fronts. At the same time, actively engaging the gray zone. Okay, in Narva area, in the Caucasus, in Ukraine, and elsewhere. So um, I want to make a very important point that for the West and the, for, for the U.S. to succeed, we call that in some army studies phase zero. We need to succeed uh, in phase zero on the tactical, operational, strategic levels. Okay? If we don't, let me simplistically explain that. If you have a hostile environment, right? If you conduct military operations in that hostile environment, it will likely backfire. And we've seen that across the history many times. So that's why going to the next phases would be probably not very helpful. So um, from that perspective, maybe 
you, it, you, the United States is not as prepared as it could be for, the, for opposing the Russian engagement in the gray zone because of the current state of sociocultural, historical, and linguistic aptitude. So we need to do more, okay, in that. So uh, that's all I had for that question. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ibrahimov. At this time, I would like to uh, uh, remind the outline stations out there that they're connected to us, that you too are welcome to uh, ask questions and participate. So please, uh, outline stations, any questions, concerns, uh, or comments, please? So if we have about seven outstations, uh, just for your information, right? It's still there. Okay. But that's up to them if they want to ask a question or right. it's, they're listening. So, uh, General Swag, do you have a, a comment on this last uh, question uh, yes. on your part? I, 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 I would like to add one thing that I think that um, it may have seen like not a lot numerically to us in the West, but got the Russians' attention. And the fact that, the, that NATO um, has, uh, has deployed three battalions uh, with the lead of uh, the UK, Canada, and um, Germany into the three, our, our Baltic friends. And then the US has put a battalion and a armor brigade in Turkey, excuse me, forgive me, Poland, um, this was not lost on the Russians. Um, and whether you have a division or a battalion of NATO forces in these countries, they are NATO forces, and the Russians now know if they want to take it a step up uh, in those areas, um, that they, they now entail a real risk of, of, um, of um, of uh, hitting NATO, uh, non-Baltic NATO personnel, and that puts it into a different, uh, different perspective with NATO populations. Thank you. Just another thing, important thing I would like to add. Uh, we mentioned about the split strategy of Russia, right? We talked about NATO, Turkey uh, teaming up with, uh, with Russia, etc. But economically, it's probably the most important, po potentially dangerous for the West or U.S. national security objectives. Economically, what's happening? Two mostly things happening, right? Uh, first of all, we've seen already in the approach of some major uh, U.S. Western allies, such as Germany, which are not willing to sacrifice its pragmatic trade and economic relationships with Russia, okay? This is the reality. Why should I consider my political considerations if I have existing pipelines gas and oil pipelines with Russia. And we showed the map. Most of them originating from Russia going to Europe. By the way, for example, the latest project was Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2. The project was supposed to go from Russia to Germany, which would turn Germany into a gas hub of Europe. Guess what? Poland blocked it. Although there was nothing to do with Poland, it wasn't even passing through the Poland territory. But because of sensitivity, understandably, they blocked, it stopped. But they are considering other projects. But the bottom line is, it's reality. And the, some of the major players are not pl willing to sacrifice that. So the second point, what is actually happening in ten, uh, like similar to NATO split? Brexit, okay? Brexit already happening, right? It's a major, in other way, uh, Western Airlines which is, which is pulling out from the European Union, right? It's the major events going on in terms of the referendum, et cetera. So just two quick points. Back to you, Dr. Hernandez. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahimov. Um, uh, I see that we have another question, so please go ahead. Yes, the panel, uh, Major Cyril from Estonia, as my Baltic brother has asked a question, obviously now I feel obliged also to uh, <laughs> some question. <coughs> Well, Sir General Swak, I absolutely agree with you that uh, probably at the moment uh, uh, the, any aggression against uh, Baltic states would be definitely a big uh, uh, opportunistic uh, bite from Russian side. But uh, I will take now, as uh, Dr. Ibrahimov mentioned many times, Turkey. I, I'm glad you did it, as obviously 
I will take my question to this region. As uh, Russian-Turkey's relations have undergone drastic changes from a uh, narrative of going to war, which was about a year ago, now basically Russia sell, uh, to the point where Russia is selling uh, uh, long-range uh, air defense systems to a country who just shot down their airplane not so long time ago. So, which is ironic, but as you uh, very correctly mentioned, in that, which is probably alarming uh, for and NATO alliance and the uh, West uh, uh, as total. So my question is, where do you see this uh, uh, friendship is going? Uh, obviously, Russia is utilizing this, uh, the exp expanding their soft power, uh, but uh, how far is it going? We know that there are some differences uh, between uh, uh, understanding of some views, like a uh, uh, question of Syria and so on. So how far is it actually going? Is Russia just using this uh, as a basis, as a daily ba understanding? or they now very clearly understood that there is a something to bite, and what are actually, maybe even a deeper side of the question, what are our options to uh, oppose it? Nice question. Yeah. Okay, so I will be happy to answer. The, this is a very, I noticed the Estonian students are very intelligent. Great questions. <laughs> and everybody else, of course. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> So the answer to your question, I completely agree with you. It should be a concern for us. But this is, I guess, the bigger question, not for one of the branches of the West or the United States. It's a kind of political question that the analysis needs to be made, adjustments to, needs to be ad, uh, done, certain adjustments. So I was part of the, uh, the, the work group as a part of the Army study. So we went to Ukraine, observed certain things, provided recommendations. Ideally, those recommendations need to inform the nas U.S. national security strategy, okay, ideally. But it's not me to make those decisions, right? It's much, much higher. So the bottom line is, if it, I was the king of the day, <laughs> okay, I would do everything possible not to allow this teaming up between, first of all, between Russia and China, between Russia and Turkey, et cetera. It is very, very dangerous for our national security objectives. So just China is a big player. I don't know if you, have you seen some movies, Turkish movies, serial of Turkish movies being played in the post-Soviet space. All of them almost translated into Russian. The Russians are increasingly fascinated by Turks and Turks by Russians, mutual cultures. Like example, uh, uh, Magnificent Century. Have you ever seen this movie? So I strongly recommend to watch this movie. You can simply type on YouTube. It's op available. You don't have to pay anything. <laughs> What's that? What's that? Netflix. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Phase one, that's what we're talking about. It wins, as we talk in the army, hearts and minds. After watching that movie, Russians will say, wow. After this temporary you know, interruption of relationships and the shutting down the plane, which was mentioned earlier, right? So immediately, you know, Russians started to pull out from Turkey, from Turkish uh, you know, beaches and resorts, etc. By the way, I, I, I read some uh, surveys. The ordinary Turks were very un unhappy, not because they lost their beautiful Russian girls, which they could date in Turkey, which was very, they, were, they were very gorgeous, they were you know, going to Turkey and uh, dating a lot of Turkish guys. Not because of that only, but simply because two cultures so much closely intertwined over the centuries essentially, although there were a lot of wars between Turkey and Russia. Again, between Russia and China, never, never been good friends, but now they're all friends. It means that we're doing something wrong, okay? We are doing something wrong. So, my my recipe uh, would be to try to improve our engagement in the gray zone jointly with our partners in the Baltics, NATO members, right, and others. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't win phase zero, we need to show, like, let me give you example from my insight. I, most of my lifetime, I lived in the country which used to be called USSR. Most of my, former military service, I spent in the Baltics, by the way, okay? I've been to Narva area and other places, in Kaliningrad Oblast. So, you know why, as a young man, particularly after he returned from the army, 
what was mostly getting into our minds, the pop Western music and classics. Bee Gees, Madonna, we were listening. I was sitting somewhere in the tent, cold. I was hiding the radio and listening because Poland was closed and other countries were closed, Germany. I was listening to Madonna, Bee Gees, et cetera. And that was turning my mind towards the West, okay? This is powerful, this is soft power, okay? Jeans, oh, it was it, not, not, not a big deal in the West to wear jeans. We were fascinated that we had jeans, you know, the Western attribute of dress, etc. Classics uh, about the cowboys, Indians. These things are powerful. So we need to think how to do these things. Because if we don't win the phase zero, we can lose it. So short answer to your question, the trend is not very positive for us right now. Okay, they're increasingly teaming up. I, can, I could give you a lot of examples what's going on between China and, uh, and uh, Russia, China and Tur uh, Turkey and Russia and Turkey among Indi India as well and others. So the, the trend is very bad. Is that answers your question, sir? Back to you, Dr. Edmonds. Okay, uh, does any of the other panelists, uh, General Swack or uh, Dr. Bauman have something to add to this uh, discussion here? Uh, I'll, I'll throw in a couple of thoughts, uh, for, put a, a slightly different uh, historical lens on it. Uh, if you look at the past 300 years, uh, Russia and Turkey were at war so often it almost looked like a recreational activity. When there was a pause in warfare with Europe or somewhere else, well, let's get back to our uh, principal pastime, which is uh, uh, fighting Turkey. Um, uh, it's, it's not at all clear that this... Um, suddenly blossoming relationship between Russia and Turkey is, is much more than a uh, reaction to expediency uh, of the moment. They've found a couple of uh, points of commonality uh, with respect to Syria and some regional questions. It also happens at the moment that Turkey uh, has a little friction uh, with, uh, with Western Europe, and this is beginning to increase. Uh, I read, I think, today that uh, uh, Angela Merkel in Germany uh, all but said that there's no door open to the EU uh, for, uh, uh, for, for Turkey. Uh, so uh, uh, at the moment, the, the, the stars are aligned that way. It's, it's not at all clear to me that they have enough long-term commonality of interest to, uh, to sustain this because there are so many things going on in the region and there are other players who are a big factor. Uh, uh, Iran, uh, for example, mm -hmm. um, and their, uh, their interests and Turkish interests don't usually align. Um, so you, you can't be buddies with everybody simultaneously. There, there's going to be some uh, sifting and, and sorting. I think the Syrian case uh, represents kind of a special moment there. Uh, with respect to China, the, the biggest thing that Russia and China have in common right now is they, they don't have any major issues uh, between them. Uh, but uh, China has issues with the United States, South China Sea, uh, general influence in, uh, in that part of the world. I, th I th also think that uh, China and Russia kind of sense that, again, U.S. influence is so enormous, you know, economic, cultural, and whatnot, that the only way to kind of slow it down uh, is to combine uh, forces from, uh, from time to time. And you see them you know, forming a block in the United Nations Security Council you know, frequently, you know, the last round of negotiations before uh, some new sanctions with respect to North Korea comes to getting the Russians and the Chinese on board uh, together. Uh, so I, I think uh, <clears throat> there's a longer uh, term foundation for some cooperation between Russia and China. I, I still don't know that their, their interests really, really align uh, that much in the long haul. I certainly recall, you know, during the, during the Soviet period and during the you know, times I spent in, in Moscow, uh, the uh, apprehensions about China were never far beneath the surface uh, in Russia, and I doubt that that's changed. The demographics alone uh, sort of scream at you, what's wrong here? You look at the, the uh, infinitesimally sparse population of Siberia, which is the, the heart of so much of Russia's resource wealth. Again, uh, demographically really sparse, and right across the frontier you've got China, you know, with a billion plus people. What's wrong with this picture? Uh, uh, and, of course, China has been sending workers to Russia for, uh, for years, as have uh, some of the Central states. Uh, um, there, there's some awkwardness about this, about this relationship that doesn't necessarily spell harmony uh, over the long run. Again, I think it's 
strategy of the moment, politics of the moment that are creating some of these alignments. By the way, to just to the same point with the question, I don't know if you are aware of the, another recent development. Germany is pulling its, its troops and all the military capabilities from Ilchilik Air Base, Ilchilik Air Base in Turkey. The, have you, it's an open press. So as a result of the friction in the relationships between Germany and, uh, and uh, Turkey, okay? What that really means? It means that uh, the, 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 the Germany would not be able to exercise its uh, duty as a Article 5 if some, some other country attacks Turkey. So this is already, that's another indication of possible split, which is already taking place. So, um, yeah, back to you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, very, very interesting uh, and rich conversation. Uh, further questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, we still have some time. Yes, yes, please. Yes. On the tape, any, any of the mics. Mm -hmm. uh, John Polori, I used to be the uh, defense attache in Belarus. I've got a few exercises under my belt. And I, I know years ago what the information operations and the messaging was at that time, uh, a little bit more uh, union-oriented. I'm, I'm interested, is anybody looking at that uh, IO fight right now uh, with Zapid going on? I know my, my Belarusian contacts have strongly expressed their displeasure with Russia over Ukraine. And I'm curious as to uh, if, if there's a, a cross in messaging between what Russia is pushing inside Belarus and what the Belarusian government is pushing. Thank you. I can try. Uh, is General Zwerk on? Or? He, I can not, try. No. Okay. Um, yes, I am. So this is a very interesting question about Belarus. Okay. Um, I spent some time whenever I could catch a Belarusian somewhere, in the corner somewhere, whatever, <laughs> talking to the people. Uh, and it's, we, we always need to understand what is the mental trend. Okay, cr grassroots thinking and the government, real politics, right? <clears throat> if I am a Lukashenko, right, the, the president of Belarus, and we remember there was some friction between him and uh, Putin. Russia, some time ago, not far, you know, recently. And then re immediately later, there we hear about the military drills, Russia jointly with Ukraine, uh, Russian, Ukraine, and I think Iranians went there as well for military drills. Okay, why? Kind of contradiction, right? We hear, oh, great news, the Belarus and Russia are not doing well, and then we hear they're doing jointly military drills. I think that, in my personal opinion, the answer is twofold. Belarus is trying to play two games, double game. Understanding that Russia, is a, as a big neighbor, is next to it, and this is the reality. At the same time, not to lose West, the West. So is it possible to double, play this double game? The time will show. That's why you can see these, you know, jumping uh, to the sides. So, and the third aspect of it, they're always the personality of the leader. You know, personality of the leader, sometimes they're patient, sometimes they're emotional, sometimes, you know, charisma we could say charismatic. Of course, he's probably charismatic by all definitions, but sometimes he can say things. I'm closely listening how he speaks sometimes. You know, interesting, his speech is very interesting. The people sitting, Nobody sitting next to him close. Everybody like on the distance. Like we, our definition of a dictator, right? Nobody can say anything if he don't make a gesture, allow somebody to speak. So stand up and speak in the room. Like on YouTube, you can speak, uh, you know, you can listen to his speeches. Um, and everybody agrees with him, okay? Um, so um, the dictatorship maybe, uh, but obviously, in my opinion, he is also kind of trying to balance, to maneuver at this time. Looks like he's not uh, political, he's politically savvy, probably. So uh, that would be my kind of, my view to answer to that question, if that makes sense. You have anything to add? I would just add something that's slightly broader uh, con contextually. I, I think that largely sums up the picture with respect to Belarus. But in the former, the now independent, formerly Soviet republics, 
uh, with, the, with several exceptions, uh, such as the, uh, the, the Baltic states and, uh, and Georgia where there, and, and Ukraine, where there's a lot of hostility uh, towards Russia uh, at the moment. And most of the other places uh, uh, find themselves kind of conflicted about their relationship uh, with, uh, with Russia. I think this is uh, widely true in Central Asia uh, and uh, with respect to uh, uh, Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan, and, and, and so forth. Uh, which is to say they, they recognize that dealing with Russia is still part of the reality. There's still a substantial cultural political legacy uh, from Russia. Uh, but uh, I have, don't think I spoke to anybody uh, who wanted to roll back the clock and uh, imagine, oh, it would be really great to go back to the good old days, be part of the Soviet Union. Um, even ideas uh, of, uh, that Russia has floated of uh, economic unions and whatnot have had some tough sledding. Uh, uh, trying to get uh, get support for broader projects. And this is also an area, by the way, in which uh, there's a, a misalignment between Russia and China, because uh, China is also interested in competing for influence in Central Asia. I mean, this is a fantastic resource-rich area if you're talking about gas and oil. And China, too, has to be looking ahead to where to what its sources will be. Uh, and uh, while uh, China and, and Russia have avoided overt tension uh, over this. Um, it's still early in the game. And they um, both would like to be, I think, the preponderant influence uh, in, uh, in that region. Uh, so uh, some of the Central Asian states and really see playing off China, Russia, and the West or the United States as, as all part of their foreign policy. Uh, so they, they really don't want to get yanked too far into anyone's orbit. Oh, he's going to yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bauman. John Swag, do you have a comment to the effect on uh, this question, please? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, uh, follow up on a few. I, I had dropped for about uh, eight minutes. But first, on Belarus, um, um, I think I already spoke on that. I would agree with, uh, with the panel. Um, I think the Russians have to handle, handle Lukashenko carefully. He's a Russian ally, but he's got his own head. Everybody knows it. He is balancing. He is a member of the, you know, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, CSTO. So they have these, these sort of little, little sort of almost, I don't even know how to, what type of an alliance to call it. But so, so the Russians, they're going through this relationship. Um, and I just don't think the Russians want to, wanna, at this time, poke them too hard. Uh, because um, um, he, is, uh, he is very, very strong-headed. And uh, while he's got opposition in Belarus now, he's got a lot of people that support him too. Two, a couple of things we, uh, we didn't mention. Uh, Turkey, yeah, Turkey's really, really complicated for Russia. I think that they have um, been playing a, a good short game. I think in part, you've got two autocrats that, that are, are, see, they're able to kind of uh, fall under each other's wings a little bit in Erdogan who's got his issues, and, and there is a little bit of a common language. The Russians also are in Syria, so, so the, 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 uh, the Turks need to deal with that. Um, also, uh, when you're talking Syria, and uh, you, you, you know, there's something that maybe is troublesome, is, is it has the, for Turkey especially, have the Russians give, given Iran too much rain in Syria, and how could this possibly blow back uh, in that area long term if you're a Sunni. So there's lots of going on. I think that they both are right now um, um, have, have fallen a little bit into each other's arms because of the external pressures they're both feeling. Um, uh, not traditional friends, not traditional allies, 13 wars between them, plus or minus, um, and the Russians have always won. Uh, so, so a lot going on there. Finally, China. Um, I think that, um, again, I think that both uh, Russia and China are, are, are practicing prudent foreign policy in the near term. I also believe that Russia is buying time in the near term, while China is biding its time in the long term. Um, as uh, Dr. Bauman laid out, um, the demographics are overwhelmingly against, uh, not in Russia's favor in the Far East, about seven to nine million people between Lake Baikal and the, and the Pacific Ocean and Vladivostok. You draw a longitudinal line, several hundred million Chinese. Uh, Russia in the Far East and, and, and Siberia is still resource rich. China will continue to chew down on its own internal resources. 
while it looks for resources ideally to buy or control early, which is what Central Asia is all about, but the Russians will find. Um, I, 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 I kind of suspect that uh, the Russians have no choice but to allow the Chinese to play the Silk Road in there. Deep down, they're probably very, very troubled because once the Chinese are in there, some will say economically they'll never leave. Um, and that kind of starts to put, you know, Russia starting already, it's already feeling vulnerable in the Far East. Um, um, and, and the economic piece is a big one. The demographic piece is a big one. They're not traditional friends. They're not ethnically similar. They're not religiously similar. And they have different interests in the area long term, though they play the North Korea card and all of that. So the Russians have got a lot to worry about in the Far East. Ultimately, I think that, that, that they're headed into um, a vassal type of arrangement of proud Russia uh, with a, a, a much more powerful uh, regionally China and how Russia manages that and also, friends, the West at the same time. Uh, stay tuned. Thank you, General Swack. Um, any other uh, questions, please? Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Will Tullock from the United Kingdom. I was lucky enough to spend some of the early months of this year in Inchlik Air Base, and at the time, the narrative that was being pushed to us about Russians' intentions in the region uh, was that, of course, it was to prevent regime change in Syria, to secure their warm water part in uh, port in Tartus, to investigate possibly other warm water ports, namely in Libya, but also to, and this was what surprised us, to potentially weaponize migration moving through Turkey and e into Eastern Europe in an attempt to destabilize the European Union. Is this a fair assessment of uh, what you think Russia's strategic objectives are in the Middle East? And if not, what do you think they are? Okay, I, I, will, uh, I will take a step, um, and my colleagues will add, I'm sure. Um, Russian involvement in Syria I think it could be expected. If you are more or less uh, expert in the area and you're analyzing and following the information, so that's why I'm saying that it could be, ex could be expected, right? Why? So from the Russian perspective, losing this traditional uh, seaport, uh, Tartus, Mediterranean seaport, would mean losing the influence in the entire Middle East. You might be aware that that port been there for, for the Soviets before and then for the Russians forever, I mean, for, for a long period of time. So that's why when they saw that the government could be changed, the Bashar family government, then could come another government which could be completely pro-Western and anti-Russian then Russian, Russians don't have any influence in the Middle East, essentially. They really view Syria as the broader uh, approach. So uh, we had a separate panel before about this issue with more details. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time because it's such an interesting, just this topic, so important, so interesting. It's not about just Syria and the Middle East. It's a global subject. You know that two world wars, started in certain geographical area, right? Where? Where does two world wars started? Anybody can answer this question? In Balkans, right? This, the first one was the killing as a pretext of the Prince Ferdinand. And the second one, as you will know, for the Soviets was Great Patriotic War. So essentially, in Europe, all the Balkans, so essentially that's how, where it started. Now some scholars talking about the middle, Syria, Potentially, not even Ukraine, but Syria. Ukraine is a kind of very unknown area for us, right? So Syria and the Middle East. Where the ISIS came from immediately emerged as a challenge. Whom, whom the Russians are bombing there? Is it the, the same groups that the West is supporting, the US supporting? This is all interesting. There's such a complexity came together. So the bottom line is the main strategy for Russia to preserve uh, Syrian, current Syrian government, they succeeded so far. And there is no sign that that government could be overthrown in the visible future. Does that make sense? Because that was 
or to a great extent because of the Russian support. They preserved the government. That was their strategic purpose. They succeeded in that. This is Alawite uh, section, sect, sect of the Islam. I don't know, you, uh, you probably know a lot about the, the religious aspects of it. So there are a lot of sects in Islam. Alawite is the Shia sect um, of Islam. It's not a branch. Branch is Shiism, Sunnism, and Harajawiya, right? It's lesser known. But Shia, uh, the, like in Iraq, you, we had, uh, right now we have uh, Shia uh, minority, right? With a Sunni majority of the population. The same in Syria. You have Alawites and the pop majority of the population Sunni. So, but before the civil war started, the religious aspect was not the case. They really, really, uh, in, in, in the same situation was in Iraq. That that was the ba Ba'ath regime, you know, nationalistic segment of it. So I kind of a little bit expanded, but the answer to your question, so far they're succeeding. Is that answer to your question? Back to you. Any other uh, additions to the uh, Syrian situation? Okay. I think we have probably uh, time just for one additional question. Uh, does anybody have a uh, maybe perhaps a different angle, different type of question to add to our discussion? Somebody up there? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Captain Chris Brandt. Uh, we have talked a little bit about how we live in kind of this world of post-truth. I, I think that uh, Dr. Bauman talked about how the quote of, you know, nothing is true, therefore anything is possible. Um, and that ambiguity that, that Russia is able to create is what gives them the space to operate within the gray zones. Um, so because next or new generation warfare relies on this Operational opera, eh, uh, that ability to take information and, and use it as a weapon system. I guess my, my question is, you know, it seems that most of our responses to this have been very reactive in nature. Uh, do you have any opinions on how we might uh, more proactively limit or counter that ability? Well, I, I, there are... A number of dimensions to dealing with that. Obviously, we need to redouble uh, uh, security of the internet and uh, and whatnot. Where we get examples every other day about somebody uh, being able to get into major databases and otherwise interfere with uh, with key systems. And that involves not just Russia, but all all kinds of state and non-state players. Um, the uh, uh, in terms of uh, Russian information activity, say stateside. I think um, just awareness here uh, that they can do that, and maybe a, a somewhat more critical attitude here towards sources and stories that suddenly pop up in that space uh, that all too often are grabbed uh, un uncritically and circulated before anybody really knows uh, what's going on. Uh, we need to shape our own attitudes about this uh, uh, just a little bit. Um, the. Uh, Russians have found this an opportune space because we kind of made it one. Uh, again, given the uh, <coughs> nature of the playing field uh, here. Um, but uh, 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 General Zwack uh, made reference to antibodies uh, earlier. And I think uh, having been through these experiences of the last year, uh, Americans are likely to be a good deal more aware of the possibilities uh, than, uh, than they were previously. Um, there's no way to prevent, you know, random stories from being inserted into that into that space. It's it's more of a critical attitude. Uh, you know, take a deep breath and consider what the, the source and the veracity of the story uh, before you uh, take it, run with it, and uh, and circulate it, and uh, and, and so forth. Um, the uh, detective work that goes on to identify where you know, some of these stories originate and, and whatnot does gradually help to inform the, uh, uh, the broader public. Um, in some respects in this realm, I'm, in, I'm inclined to go with uh, the late George Kennan's formula for the Cold War. Uh, if the U.S. first and foremost pays attention to looking after its own institutions and values and cultivates good habits with respect to information uh, or whatever, uh, that'll go a long way to keeping us secure from, uh, from some of these other influences. Um, Russia's strategic position in the long view is still 
uh, rather weak uh, in my estimation, economically uh, and politically, and although they've shown a lot of gamesmanship, they've been very resourceful and creative, um, they nevertheless are playing a, a rather difficult, difficult hand. They've been very active, uh, but it's a difficult uh, situation. Um, our uh, uh, greatest wounds are, are still liable to be self-inflicted, and so we need to you know, pay attention to our own knitting uh, a good deal more. Yeah, before I add to Dr. Bauman, so you yes. want to ask uh, Dr. Zweig? Yeah, General Zweig, uh, we're, uh, we're in our last question. If you have any comments on, uh, uh, basically, as a refresher, what actions, if any, can we uh, as Americans take to be uh, more proactive in, uh, in, in the face of this uh, active measures by, by the uh, Russians? Yes, um, uh, first let me quickly, um, if this is our last uh, parlay, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Ibrahimov for bringing me on. It's an honor to talk to you all. And I've got to call out Dr. Bob Bauman. Uh, I was one of his young cub reporters back in 95, 96, the Command of General Staff College. And I was fascinated, and I used, lo used to love going into his office and talking about it. Uh, Dr. Bauman, Bob, I still want to go to Georg Tepe. All right, so we, let's talk. We can do that. All right. We we'll can get do you, that. Let's get, yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get to your, uh, okay, the, the question as a, as a wrap-up, because it is, it is, in many ways, it gets at the heart and soul of our, our societies, not necessarily our nations only, but our societies. And, um, and it's at the crux. I, I think getting at a, a point that, um, that the doc, Dr. Bauman did bring up is that Russia does feel threatened. I mean, in their, and from their narrative, and if we sit back, we don't have to agree with them, but we need to at least take a deep breath and look at the perspective. Enlargement of NATO is one, and I'm a big NATO guy. But from a Russian perspective, they feel the West stole the march on them, and they really believe that. Uh, I believe that NATO was righteous, and, and I'm glad we did it, but somewhere in there the messaging got lost, and they're absolutely uh, psychotic on this issue. And then there are other things as well. Um, but uh, um, so, so, the, so, again, there is a real threat view, and so when I'm speaking um, at times hard, if you will, on the Russians per se, um, uh, it's not it's not not to mean that they have a threat view that as we talk about them and try to figure all this out that we must take into account and respond to in various fora which frankly today don't exist in many places anymore okay world of world of post truth um again uh, I think that uh, the Russians feel threatened. They, they, they're outspent, they're outmanned, they're outgunned. What they have is initiative. They can call on surprise. Um, let me throw this out. We talk about asymmetry, getting at the vulnerabilities of your potential foe. I think also, in the Russians' perspective, asymmetry is a sense of your own vulnerability. And that makes you really, really focused on, 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 on ways to, to get at that and to mitigate that. And I think that the gray zone is a huge piece of it. Ways to respond, and I know a lot of people are working on it. First and foremost, it's coordination. You're, a, we're never going to get our media and our, 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 uh, to agree on a state position to put out. It's just not how we do business. But we ideally would have centers where media is co-located that are working and looking and listening and, and can kind of compare notes and then put their messages out, ideally in a coordinated fashion and quickly. Because the gray zone is now, again, we go back to Agitprop and the, and the Soviet eras and other countries. Um, gray zone is not new. Whispering campaigns, you know, used to take weeks, days, weeks, to get to your intended audience. Today, a whispering campaign is cyber fast, seconds, minutes, and we are slow um, in processing all this fake news and everything else into coherent, coordinated responses where you've got to get back and push back on that messaging quickly before the lie becomes the truth. Um, and we're not good at that. Um, 
crosstalk in every, you know, and, and it, it, again, organizationally, um, ideally multinationally. I know there's been a lot of work on that. And it isn't just that, it is also, and we talked about it, is inoculating our populations and our children. It's the, the, the fake news inoculation's gotta start in schools. And again, I mentioned that we don't wield the truth well enough and fast enough. Um, um, and all of this uh, gives, the, uh, gives countries like Russia, regimes like Russia, the edge, because it can move fast they can lay out mistruths, and, and we're on the defensive. Uh, last thing, notably, the Finns, if you've been reading, just stood up a center of hybrid, if you will, countering hybrid warfare and all that um, uh, in, in Finland. So there are good efforts going on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, General Zwak, for your, for your comments and your participation. Uh, your enormous uh, knowledge of the area has really certainly uh, uh, helped us here understanding much better. Um, at this time, um, uh, I would I like to. Can I add to the question? Please? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. Um, bef before we before we uh, continue, uh, Dr. Ibrahimov has uh, additional comments pertaining to to your question. So go ahead. Right, real quick, uh, just to um, in my personal opinion, observations, past observation, current observations, that I think you know, I wanna warn about one thing. Uh, that we never should underestimate the adversary. We could overestimate, but not underestimate. So the short answer to your question, what needs to be done to oppose the Russian engagement, effective maybe engagement in the gray zone? I, my suggestion, quick, quick answer, and I, that would make me very happy that everything fall under Army's culture language program, and uh, it would make me a big boss. Just kidding. But. There is a truth what, in what I said. We need to learn cultures, regional considerations, histories of other countries. Very important. Otherwise, it is unlikely we can win uh, the gray zone. Okay? So, as a result, in my personal observation, Russia's information messaging usually wins the narrative so far in the post-Soviet space, unfortunately, because of all those reasons we described before. Movies, Interwine cultural, historical, uh, uh, you know, heritage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Quite likely, Russian gray zone target audiences don't know much about newly incorporated Russia's tactics, techniques, and procedures. We call them TTPs in some studies. Okay, that's why they need to be more carefully, thoroughly researched to be able to oppose. Does that make sense? So another thing, through economic means, we need to be more aggressive. Give me, let me give you, it's a good thing, it's, there is a map here. This is very good example, in my opinion, baku Cheham pipeline, you know, which originates from Baku and goes to the Turkish uh, Mediterranean port of Cheyhan, which is not visible here, it's a different kind of map. But it goes down through Georgian territory, okay, and we talked about that before where the pipeline originating and which territory is passing through, it gives the country's leverage. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing, this pipeline, and I was happy to be in the beginning of that project as a senior diplomat, it still remains the only pipeline which is bypassing the Russian territory. What that really means. Russia doesn't have leverage over, this pipe, uh, over that territory, and that help, help to enhance the independence uh, of those literal countries minus Iran, okay? So that's the reality. And we, we, when we were approaching the oil companies, they would skeptically tell us at the time, I'm talking about, uh, you know, 90s, when we started Putopuzhi's project. Oh, I'm not going to Azerbaijan, it's not, you know, because the capacity of that pipeline was supposed to be one million barrels of oil daily. Guess what, Azerbaijan doesn't have that oil. Without the Kazakh oil, it is economically not viable, okay? But strategically, it was very important. And that happened in May 2005 when the pipeline became operational. So that's another thing the West needs to push, the economic trade relationships, which would make them more attractive to Germany to prevent them from cooperating with Russia, Turkey, China, etc. Does that make sense? So I think 
these things need to be very well researched and that certain decisions need to be made. I think this is a little direct, but a little bit more expanded uh, answer to your question. Dr. Hernandez, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ibrahima, for your unique uh, personal experiences that shed so much light on the geostrategic realities. Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, uh, sum up uh, some of our discussion from my perspective as an uh, interested uh, listener, too. And uh, one of the things that emerged from the discussion was the importance of geography. Uh, you know, some people thought uh, some years ago that uh, both history was done as such and that the world was flat. And we are finding more and more than uh, geography does matter, as Robert Kaplan uh, explains in one of his latest books. Uh, and also that, uh, uh, that uh, the, the world still, uh, this distance uh, is, is significant. Is significant. We, uh, as, as, uh, for this particular audience of uh, many students at, uh, at the Command General Staff College, the importance of all the elements of national power is, is really uh, comes to the fore in, in such a discussion. As, as we take a look at the dime construct, the uh, diplomacy, the informational part, the military as well as the uh, economic aspects all play uh, uh, together uh, uh, to uh, project national power, uh, particularly in this new uh, and brave new world of the, uh, we're calling the gray zone. So it is very important for us to be cognizant not only of the military factors, but also of the three other factors that we consider when we talk about uh, geopolitics. Uh, finally, the importance, as, as uh, all our speakers highlighted, of understanding on the one hand history and on the other hand culture. Uh, we have to have a solid understanding, which is not the same as passing acquaintance with history or passing acquaintance with culture. We have to, as professionals in the military or in security, we have to have a deeper understanding. That's the only way that we can have a strategic edge. So, gentlemen, uh, Dr. Bauman, Dr. Ibrahimov, and General Swag, thank you so much for your insightful comments uh, and, and your sharing of that uh, information and personal experiences. Uh, finally, what I would like to have is Dr. Ibrahimov would like to show you uh, how to access the Kremlin site so you can go back, uh, maybe even revisit the conversation and even pu uh, pull off or pull out some um, uh, reading material, reading list, and videos uh, to continue your exploration of this important subject. So with that said, uh, please, uh, Dr. Ibrahimov, uh, go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Hernandez. So we try to create quite robust program that we just don't conduct an event and then it's over. So for that purpose, next slide, please. For that purpose, we established quite robust website, OK? So just to, to show you, uh, this is the ATN uh, homepage that you can see some of those organizations we are leveraging in our activities. It's a DIA, CIA, uh, DLI, among me, central, inter I mean, the, the geospatial intelligence agency, among many others, OK? So um, next slide, please. So if you click on that previous logger, it will get you, it's a public domain. It will get you to that page, OK? So by the way, we established Krelmo Digital Library. Our latest book, which uh, Krelmo sponsored, is already there, among other related uh, books and articles. So if you click on the sec second sub-tab, please. Next slide, please. So it will get you to the upper portion of the target page or, or, or slide. So next slide, please. So this is where all videos of our previous sessions are posted. If you missed an event, like today's event, you can go and the newest event will be posted right here. OK? This is the old uh, page. There are more, much more above. Uh, we mentioned about Syria, right? For example, that panel was dedicated to Syria, US policy or Russian policy in Syria. And we invited the think tank professor from DC to cover this. And she was originally from Moscow, Anna Borshevskaya. So video of the today's session going to be right here with this related publication, PowerPoints, and photos for your convenience. 
and others who missed today's mission, they can get back. You can access this public domain website from anywhere, from your smartphone. All you need to do, just type in the browser, Krell Management Office, okay? It will get you right there. If you are somewhere in China, just kidding. So <laughs> then you can read about our panel that Dr. I was saying some stupid things there. So anyways, so anywhere, okay? Ge geography is not a limited thing. And this is all our previous, uh, in addition to other capabilities. You can find a lot of good capabilities. Next slide, please. This is our contact information. Okay, if you have any questions, any time at 2 a.m., just kidding, don't call me at 2 a.m. Um, so this is the contact information, okay? For your convenience, this is because this is for you and across the army, as you could see, it's linked through VTC across the army. ASCC, COE schools, everybody has this opportunity to listen, to ask their questions through VTC. That we do that every two, three months. Okay, Dr. Hernandez, you wanna conclude? Thank you, Dr. Ibrahimov, and uh, we have a, an announcement uh, uh, for many of you will be an interesting event as well. As Dr. Ibrahimov said, uh, these, these events, these panels are held approximately every two to three months. And the topics are usually very, uh, very upfront in the news. They are very pertinent to all of us. So uh, we invite you to uh, continue the, the conversation and we'll announce the, the next panel. And, uh, I, I just, over to you. yeah, I just have a brief announcement for the local audience. This does not apply to the outstations. Former American ambassador to Afghanistan has just returned from a trip to Kabul. He'll be visiting Kansas on the 21st of September. If anybody is interested in attending an event with him, please see me or I will pass information off to Dr. Ibrahimov. Also, the former U.S. ambassador to Turkey will be in Kansas City on the 25th of September. And the same thing, I can provide information for those that were interested. Thank you, sir. Thank you very thank much. You. Well, thank you for your participation. This concludes our session for today. Thank you all. We'll hang around here for a while in case we have questions. Mm -hmm.